Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Little and you're listening to the Filmmaking Friends Podcast, episode number four. Today, we're hanging out with full-time filmmaker, actor, and good friend, Ms. Bitsy Tulloch. She's up in my hometown of Vancouver, Canada, working on the CW show Supergirl. She's playing the part of Lois Lane, and she's going to rock it. We had to do this interview over a Skype call, so the audio is not great, but hey, the interview is. Hey, thanks so much for hanging out with me on my little podcast today. Thank you for having me, Ryan Little. It's good to hear your voice. It's been a while. We, uh, We worked together on a movie called We Love You, Sally Carmichael, and it's been a couple years now, right? Yeah, I guess we shot that in June of 2016, so two years. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy how time flies. It, it really is. Um, Bitsy's probably most well-known for the TV series Grimm, and she played Juliet on that. And that was like six seasons, right? Six seasons. In the first four seasons, I played Juliet, and then they uh, I was reborn as a Hexen Beast, which is sort of this powerful witch, and that character's name was Eve. So the final two seasons, right. I that's... played a totally different character. So that was pretty fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I enjoyed the show. It was a really great show. And, and certainly that wasn't the first thing that you've, you've ever done. You, you've done other television um, shows. You were actually in that movie, The Artist. Yes, right? I was. Because you, like, you were like in the movie, inside the movie, basically. Mm-hmm. It's so funny, too. I got, I got that job, and I remember telling people... I, I really just think it's this cool art house flick that I'm doing. There's a great cast, like awesome actors that signed on, but you know, it feels like maybe it's going to be some like little indie art house, you know, hit. And meanwhile, it went on yeah. to like sweep the Academy Awards. It's you crazy. Know? Usually I ask people like when they got the bug to want to work full time in the film industry. But I know that before that happened for you, you were actually going to Harvard, right? Yeah, that's correct. And what were you studying at Harvard? What was that? I double majored in English and American literature and the fine arts. And um, my plan was to go to England and I wanted, I was going to get my master's degree in the fine arts and, and have a gallery because I love art. I love collecting art, but I basically took a year off because I was pretty burned out from academics my senior year. And I was in LA with uh, an actress friend who wanted to audit some acting classes. And I ended up going with her and you know to make a long story short i i fell in love with this one teacher who was really difficult and it was she she was trained in all theater so i realized like i was really in over my head if i wanted to do this professionally and so i didn't actually even start auditioning until i was almost 25 which is ancient in this industry especially these days i feel like people are acting by the time they're in high school um, right. but, uh, for me, I started somewhat late, um, and I got lucky and I booked a pretty big opportunity, like fairly quickly. And, um, yeah. you know, I've been working ever since, like as an actor, sometimes there's lulls in between, like I shot one of the leads in this huge big budget HBO pilot, but it didn't, uh, the three lead actors were kept under a, a talent holding deal with HBO. And that was like well over a year. So in hindsight, would I have taken the holding deal? No, because it didn't end up going to series and we couldn't work at all. So I'm kind of like, all right, well, that was a year in my late twenties and my prime years of working that I just, I wasn't able to do anything because they didn't know when we were going to reshoot the pilot. So anytime I had an opportunity, we would call HBO and say, can we do this? And they'd be like, yeah, we'd really rather you didn't. We don't know when we're going to reshoot. Um, but so there's lulls in between, of course. This industry is what it is. But, uh, but yeah, it's been pretty consistent. Now, did you, do you remember your very first audition? Yes, it was so bad. Actually, this is the other reason I, I decided to, when I was 22 or 23, and I decided, you know what, let's, make, let's try this out professionally. I had an audition. I don't even know how I got the audition, but it was for a Hallmark movie. And I was so green you know, if you have an audition, you're reading with the casting director as if that's your partner in the scene. And I was so green. I did it to camera and you don't do that. And <laughs> right. so it was really embarrassing. And she stopped me. And um, I realized this is a small town and people are going to remember me if I keep going into rooms and I'm, I'm making rookie mistakes like that. So at that point, I, I said, no more auditioning. I need to hone my craft. I need to figure out what I'm doing. I need to know what this looks like. And so I studied with a theater t- teacher for, for a couple of years. 
Um, and then I started auditioning again. And of course that turned into, like you said, was it, um, what was the HBO show? Was that Quarter Life? Or no, was that Quarter else? Life was, was kind of the, the show that put me on the map. It was a show that Ed Zwick and Marshall Hertzkovitz did. And they had created Once and Again and My So-Called Life and 30-something. And they won an Academy Award for Shakespeare and Love. They, these were huge writer-producers. And they decided to do a show for NBC, but that would premiere online first. So it was one of the very first online series. Um, and they were casting for it and they read everyone. And I was supposed to go in for a different role. And again, a little bit, this is where being green actually helped me. I, I said, when I got the audition, like I will, I will audition for this role, but only if I can read for the series lead. And uh, Marshall had said, no, I don't think you're right for the series lead. She really needs to be a wallflower and blend in the background. And, and, and I said, well, you haven't seen me without makeup on, we, you know, and greasy hair and a sweatshirt. So, so I'm like, let me just try. And I ended up booking it. I was, my instinct was right, which is like, that was my role. And that, um, that both put me on the map. And it also taught me a really important lesson because it got canceled almost immediately. We only did six episodes. So that was heartbreaking. And, um, but I learned that, you know, this industry can be fleeting and you literally just have to pick yourself up and move on. You cannot fixate right. on stuff and you can't take it personally. It had nothing to do with me. Um, it was, you know, in my opinion, uh, the show was a little too edgy for the time, which was 2008. I think now it might have worked, you know, on a on perhaps like the CW or uh, Freeform or something, but uh, it didn't work on right. NBC. So you you get you get your your feet wet working on these these great projects, um, and then and then it, you get the opportunity to be a lead for on Grimm, which is which is fantastic and was a great experience for you, I'm sure. Um, what's that process like going through getting well on any of these shows, but specifically Grimm? Like, was that a was that a long process of going through a lot of callbacks and and having different people see you audition no. or was it pretty pretty painless no actually the washingtonian which was a huge pilot i did for hbo that one took a long time um i mean they were auditioning every girl in hollywood for like six months they really wanted that one took a long time grim i was when you're an actor and you're you're kind of a finalist for a series regular role on a tv show you have to go through this thing called the test process you first would text, test for the studio. And if the studio approves you, you, you advance the next day or the next week or whenever to the network and the network makes the final decision. Now, for some reason, I guess they had been testing women for the lead female on Grimm and nobody, they didn't like anyone. And then they had a favorite. So they were like, oh, this is the girl, this is the girl. And then last minute they, they said, well, let's let's just audition a couple more people for the producer session to see if anyone if we like anyone else but they they were convinced that they had their girl and i got the audition on a tuesday and the producer session was on a wednesday so this is february 2011 um and i went in for the producers and i did each scene once and they were like, thank you. So I walked out thinking, oh, God, they didn't like me. Because usually if they really like you, they want to work with you. They want to chit chat with you. They want to keep you there. So I thought I blew it. I was, well, I didn't think I blew it. I was like, I did a really good read, but they, I guess I'm just not what they're looking for. And then Sean Hayes from Will and Grace, who also happened to be an executive producer on Grimm, called my agency and said, she's testing tomorrow. Tell her not to change a single thing. We thought we had our girl. Bitsy's actually the girl. So what happened really was that I just happened to be exactly what they were looking for. And that's why they didn't need to see anything else. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's really fast. You typically don't test the very next day because then your lawyer gets involved and they're working on a deal and everything. But I tested for sure. studio on Thursday, advanced the network on Friday and booked it, you know, Friday afternoon, I found out it was mine. Um, so that wow. was really fast process but typically i would say that's unusual yeah and then of course the show shot in oregon portland mm -hmm. so you you had to move and yeah you had, had you ever done that for a tv series before uh not not completely relocate no i mean i was in baltimore for a long time working on that hbo pilot uh but 
this was the first time I actually had to pick up my life and move. Fortunately, Portland was an awesome city and the cast was great. I ended up marrying the lead on the show. So yeah, I mean, there yeah, was good chemistry. That's a pretty good, yeah. that's a pretty good rap, rap gift, right? Yeah. <laughs> David always likes to say that he, uh, everyone always wants to know like what souvenirs did we take home from set? And he's like, I don't know, my wife. That's a pretty good one. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, so I, being a being a director, I know that when I worked with you on Sally Carmichael, I was the cinematographer, which I still do, and I'm very passionate about. That's where I started my career, and I still do it occasionally. But you know, as a director, I'm kind of interested, you know, to ask you a question about because you've worked on so many shows with so many directors, and you say you've been on like, for example, Grimm. You've been on there for six seasons, or you've been on there, you know, you're in season four, or whatever. And these directors are coming, and and you know, what? you're pretty seasoned by that point. What, what do you see as a good quality for a TV director? Like, what are like, what are like, okay, this is going to be a good director. Um, when they, ha when they really have a vision and, and you can tell like they're really prepared, that also makes the crew mm -hmm. and the actors feel at ease. Every so often you'll have an actor who's just clear, uh, sorry, a director who just clearly didn't do their homework enough and figured they could mm -hmm. get to set and wing it. And then it ends up being chaotic. And on a show like Grimm, we shot very long hours, uh, eight day episodes, and we shot often at night in the dark, in the rain. And so you don't want to have somebody who's like kind of dilly dallying or wasting time because they didn't bother doing their, their homework. So that was a big one. I also particularly like, I really liked um, the directors who cared a lot about their relationships and the acting on a show like Grimm, there were, there were some directors who would show up who really only cared about the action and the monsters and stuff. And truthfully, mm -hmm. those episodes didn't work as well. The, the episodes that were the fan favorites were ones that were sort of heavy on their relationship stuff and, and the characters. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that was a big deal. And I'm trying to think what else. Every so often, I think directors, especially if you're, if you're a lead on the show and you've done 123 episodes, I would sometimes have a director who just didn't want to give me notes because they just either trusted me or, or something. And you don't want that. I mean, as, as an actor, you, you want notes, you kind of want to play. So it, yeah. I, I didn't love it when somebody, I would just like go do an entire episode without having been given any direction whatsoever. Cause I want to be pushed and it's like, maybe, maybe my instinct is correct, but shouldn't we try it another yeah. way too? You know? Yeah, no, I think th that's, that's great. That's great to know that like, it's, you know, cause you know your character obviously better than anybody else. Cause you've been living that character. I, I can totally see how some directors would be like, well, I mean, she knows her character, so I don't know what I could tell her, but, but I can see how you like to have that, that experience where, you know, whether you agree with the note or not, at least they're giving you that feedback. They're giving you their opinion. And then you guys, you know, see what you guys can make out of that to, and to make the episode as, as good as it can be, of course. Yeah. Right? So that's great. And I'm assuming also, and maybe this is more the network liking this quality in a director, and maybe it's the same for the actors, definitely for the crew is uh, a director who's quick and can get the day done uh, on time or early right? That doesn't matter as much. Um, there were a couple directors who were notoriously really fast and sometimes their director, their episodes were not as good. Now, were mm. we happy on the day? Yes. I remember there was one Friday and Fridays we usually would shoot what we call a fratter day because you're shooting into mm -hmm. Saturday morning, sometimes until the sun comes right. up. But we wrapped with him at like three or four o'clock on a Friday and you would think, it, it, I mean, it, it really was like everybody's the best day of their lives. The crew was so ecstatic. Yeah. Now, his episode was actually great. He's a seasoned director named Aaron Lipstadt. He used to run Median. But the, so he, he actually was one of the fastest consistently who also delivered. But every so often you'd have somebody who just kind of wanted to, to speed through it. And, and sometimes that didn't work because you, you could tell like they weren't when you're when you've spent as much time on a set as I am, you know when there's certain coverage that you need on a scene, and uh, and you know it's they're not getting it, you know. And then that also mm -hmm. sometimes means sure. you have to reshoot, and nobody wants to reshoot stuff. Everybody would rather just get it on the day, in that yeah, moment, you yeah. know. So from being on TV as much as you have, have you ever caught the bug to want to direct yourself? 
You know, it's funny because one of my majors in college was the fine arts. And within that, I specialized in photography. So I, I do think I have a pretty good eye. That said, I have not had the urge to direct. What I have had a blast doing was uh, I produced a film that I also starred in that premiered at Tribeca Film Festival in 2012. Um, and I also, it didn't get bought, but I also had created a TV show that I attached an amazing director to named Leslie Linka Glatter. She's nominated for an Emmy almost every year for Homeland. But she, that show didn't get bought, but that, that was really fun as a kind of show creator. So... I could see, I could see, sort of segueing into that at some point. That that, that made me just th- think of another question, actually, for you. I mean, you know, you've probably done a variety of different kinds of characters and things. Is there something that you know that you would be passionate about producing a certain genre or playing a certain kind of character? I mean, do you like period pieces? I mean, where where would you like to go next? I actually, do like period you? pieces. Two of the films I did, The Artist, which was a period piece, and I also did a film yeah, called yeah. Parkland, opposite. Paul Giamatti, and that that took place uh, in, I guess, 1963, because it was about JFK's assassination. And uh, I'd love doing period stuff, so that it'd be it'd yeah. be really fun to do more of that. Is that more because um, just because you like the wardrobe and things that are there, and and how they've kind of transported you to a different time period, or or is it because it's sometimes about a real story from the past, or what? What is it about period pieces that you like? It's easier to get. It's easier for me to get in character on a period mm-hmm. film because if it's modern, it's so it's kind of easy to just sort of fall back on yourself. Mm, uh, sure. And that you can't sense. do that in period. People walked differently. They talked differently. They held themselves differently. Uh, and so it's yeah. almost as if you were in, like, the wardrobe being so different, it almost feels like you're in prosthetic makeup or something. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's easier sure. to sort of lose yourself in a role. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that now. That kind of makes me think about, like, I've I've directed a handful of World War II movies and. When you know you're in a scenario where everybody's dressed up in period clothing, you've got World War II tanks there. They start shooting the blank guns and everything. For just moments, at times, especially when I'm looking through the lens, if I'm directing and shooting, sometimes um, it transports me as if I'm really there, and it doesn't feel like anything modern. You know, it feels like I'm in a totally different place, and it feels very organic and real. And so I imagine that somewhat, I mean, if you aren't looking directly at the camera crew, you kind of get lost in the, at, at moments, and you feel like you've been transported back in time. Yeah, especially on the artist, because because it was a um, silent film. Mm-hmm. The director, Michelle Hazanavicius, he, had, he was playing music from the era uh the entire time so that that experience was really really truly felt like it was back in you know the 30s or whatever now you and i got to work on we love you sally carmichael together with uh, chris gorham he was the director Mm -hmm. um such a great guy and and sebastian roche yeah he's become a really close friend of mine since then you know what's actually funny is i remember after we did the show, I, I started to like watch Grimm a lot. Like I had watched it a little bit, but I really started watching it because at that point I, 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 you know, had been working with you and I knew you and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to support her and watch her show. And I remember that Sebastian actually plays a villain in season one of Grimm. Yeah. That was before I didn't work with him. So when we did the, we love you, Sally Carmichael together, he had mentioned that he had done Grimm. But I was like, oh, wow, mm-hmm. I didn't even work with you. But yeah, he was he was great on it. And to be honest with you, like the, all the seasons are really great. But Sebastian, by far, for me, played the scariest villain of all the villains. He was just so menacing just with what he did with just simple gestures and line deliveries and everything. He's just like, oh, my gosh, like now that's a villain. Right. So. I totally remember that as one of my favorite favorite episodes of that. Yeah, he's just great. He's fantastic. I should rewatch it. He's he's so good. Um, so now that now that you kind of you know you did that for six years, you were up in in Portland. Oh, did you ever at any point while in Portland were you ever on Portlandia? Because it I seems was. like you should have been. You were right there. Oh, you were. I was. Okay, yeah. good. 
Um, I, was that a good experience? It was, was awesome. Fun? You know, Fred Armisen uh, is a friend of mine from Portland. We met, we were actually living, we were, it was so funny. When I first moved up to Portland, I had this moment where I was like, did I even leave LA? Because the building I moved into was, I unbeknownst to me, was the actor heavy building. And there were a couple of shows shooting there. Leverage, was, which was on TNT, shot there. Portlandia shot there. And so I was in the elevator up to my floor and I, I met Timothy Hutton, who was the lead on Leverage. And then I get off my floor, I'm moving into my apartment and I, I bump into Fred Armisen. <laughs> I was like, what are, like, they just felt so Hollywood. And it was an apartment building in Portland, right. Oregon. But, um, so Fred and I stayed friends and he called me up and he's like, I have a really fun role for you. He's like, I'm unfortunately not in the scenes with you. It's going to be with Carrie. But, uh, so he just offered it to me. It was really fun. It was also very different from Grimm. Grimm is obviously a much bigger yeah, sure. budget. And so it was very tightly organized and coordinated and and portlandia was just sort of free and and, and kind of loose but but also a little chaotic because i remember there was one moment where nobody knew if they were wrapped or not you know yeah uh, but it was really fun it was very hot i think i want to say we shot it in like august or something and and carrie and i were in a driving around in a car and we couldn't have the windows open so uh, it was oh. really hot, but that was a blast. Oh. Well, I'll definitely have to check out that episode. I'm sure. I'm sure it's that's such a funny show. Yeah. So. And now you know it's funny because now everybody sort of has left. Well, I don't know. There could be some other series filming in Portland, but you know, Grimm is over now. You guys have left. Leverage, of course, ended. They were conti- uh, Dean Devlin, who I've worked with, who produced that show, also did another show called the librarians and they filmed that in portland now that's done and so now they've they're they've left so i'm not really sure um if portland has any big shows going on there anymore which is kind of well portlandia of course is still there now portlandia is done but, as well oh well, see yeah now it's kind of like port you know it's kind of like portland had its heyday i hope i hope they get a you know a second run i hope some more shows go back there because it's yeah. such a wonderful city well there's there's a netflix show that shoots there i forget what it's called although I, i'm not sure it was renewed yeah you know a lot of the crew we're still friends with and they've been coming down to la to work more which is a bummer because portland's an amazing city and and it's also yeah. uh cheaper for for them to be living in um i'm sure something will shoot there it's so accessible and now that grim's gone i know i know part of the reason productions weren't there is that grim ate up a lot of the tax incentives there's only so many tax incentives mm-hmm. available sure but now that that's right. gone i would be surprised if something doesn't move there well i know that you've got a lot to do i appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today um, can you tell people where they can find you on social media, where they can keep up to date with what you're doing? Yeah, I think on my public Facebook page, I think it's under Elizabeth Telek, but it's verified. So it's either going to be under Bitsy Telek or Elizabeth Telek. And both my Twitter handle and my Instagram handles are both um, at Bitsy Telek, which is B-I-T-S-I-E-T-U-L-L-O-C-H. And I'm pretty active on both. So thank you, Bitsy, again for for hanging out with me today, and I wish you the very best of luck on your future endeavors. Oh, it was nice to talk to you again. All right, and we'll uh, we'll have lunch in Vancouver, and we won't eat poutine. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks everybody for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.